<clears throat> well, good morning and welcome this morning to our service. It's great to have you with us this morning. It's great to be able to continue to spend this time together even though we're not able to physically meet. Well, this morning we are going to be spending time continuing through Acts, looking later at Acts 15 verses 1 to 21 and thinking about uh, the conversations that are being had around entry into the kingdom of God. So later we'll, we'll think about that and, and we'll pray that the Lord would lead us. But as we begin, let us pray together. Father, we, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for giving us the ability to come together to spend time in your word. Lord, we thank you for technology, for the way that you have worked in, in all of these things to guide, to give us the opportunity to meet still. Father, we pray that you would be amongst us now. Amen. Well, we have many of our normal pandemic meetings going on, so we're still going to be having our daily Bible times with Auntie Liz for the children on our YouTube and Facebook page. We've got our Tuesday morning Pebbles talk on our Pebbles Facebook page. We've got our Wednesday night Bible study as well, and then our Friday time with the youth, which has been going very well recently with many of them choosing to come and join in with the quiz that we've been putting on and then the short talk afterwards. So do be praying for all of those outreach events as there are a way of keeping in touch with people that, that we are not able to see. And do be praying for those that we haven't been able to keep in touch with due to constraints around what we're allowed to do. Do be praying for all of those who, who are missing out on their contact from the church. Well, we're going to be spending our, our service in a normal way this morning, so we'll have a song soon, followed by a kid's talk from Andy, a kid's song, uh, the prayers and the reading before we come back together to look at those words from Acts 15. So let's sing together now. good it's ever faithful worth more than gold the heart's delight your word gives life to all who hear and obey your word endures forever your word is true it never changes it formed the earth, sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my path. J. 
Good morning. I hope you're all being well and keeping safe. Welcome to Sunday Morning's Kids Talk. This morning we're going to carry on with the series of what every child should know about God. And I think it's been absolutely wonderful that various people have been able to carry on with this series over the last few months. And we've got to thank God for that. Because God has provided the technology for us all to be able to keep this going and to be able to watch on our TVs right now or our tablets or phones or whichever way you decide to watch this. And it's wonderful. So we praise God in everything. It just shows how loving and caring God is. Now, before I start in the actual book, and also I managed to get the page through Pastor Ben as he sent me the picture of the page and I was able to print it off so I can show you guys the page so that way you can still see the page absolutely wonderful what God does for us isn't it now I'm just going to quickly read Luke 1 35 because I've got a sense that this ties in with what we're going to read this morning and this is when Mary is talking to the angel when she finds out she's pregnant with Jesus. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That tells us straight away that Jesus is God. And he lived a perfect life, as we saw throughout the entire Bible, especially through the Gospels, that he lived a perfect life. And he had to be perfect, because he's God's son. Right? So he is this morning's. Yeah? And it is, God is holy. And it says that God is holy. This means that he never does anything wrong. He always does what is right. No one else is holy like God. For all of us have sinned. Which means we have done things wrong. But God is perfect. As I say, when we look in Jesus' life, Jesus was perfect. And he lived a perfect life. And we see that through God's word in the Bible. Isn't it wonderful? And yeah, and he's always right, as we see there, look. And he's always right. That's why we call him a righteous God. Because he's always going to be right. Now, here's a picture of a little boy in a shop. But what I'm about to tell you, though, is going to shock you in that picture. The boy in the picture is taking something which is not his. We don't do that. This is wrong. God does not make mistakes. And that's right. God never has never made a mistake. And he never will. Because he's holy and righteous. So today's question is... As you can see there, who is holy 
and has never done anything wrong. And the answer to that is God. So we need to remember that at all times, that God is holy and is always there for us. I'll say a quick prayer and there'll be a song. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being so holy and looking after us. And thank you for providing the technology that we have to make sure that we do keep your work going in this world. As this world definitely does, especially at times like this, need your word. They need to know that you are still there for them. Lord, you are awesome and powerful and mighty. Lord, look after these children and put your word on their heart. Amen. Sending us his own son, Jesus died for us. God showed us his love when Jesus died for us. While we were his enemies, God showed us his love. How do we know what? Love is God showed us his love by sending us his own son Jesus died for us God showed us his love when Jesus died for us while we were his enemies God showed us his love his love by sending us his own son Jesus died for us God showed us his love when Jesus died for us while we were his enemies God showed us his love God showed us his love when Jesus died for us while we were his enemies God showed us Well, good morning. We're going to spend some time together now in prayer. So let's all pray. Dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to worship you, to lift up our hearts and our voices in praise and adoration. We thank you that you are a great God, the one who is the true and living God, the one who is worthy of all praise and glory and honour. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us through this morning's service to give uh, to you all the glory that is rightfully yours. We thank you that we can come to you because we have uh, a saviour the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us who died upon the cross that we might be able to approach you and to come to you though you are holy and high and lifted up yet we thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ we have access into your presence we can come to the throne of grace and there worship you and glorify you without fear of condemnation without fear that we shall be turned away for in the Lord Jesus Christ we are accepted and we are your dear children so we thank you Heavenly Father for forgiveness of our sins we thank you Father that we can know the cleansing power of forgiveness of pardon with you 
Uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, we can have peace with you and know that uh, we have a righteousness, not of our own, but that which has been given to us through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will uh, draw near to us day by day. We are in strange times, O oh Lord, and uh, some of us perhaps are finding it difficult uh, because of the isolation, separation from others. But Lord, we pray that you will draw near to us and help us day by day to draw near to you, for you have promised to draw near to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, be with us then as a church, watch over us and keep us. And uh, we pray, Father, for all the different activities that are taking place this week. We pray that uh, you would uh, <coughs> bless the uh, the uh, uh, Pebbles talk on Tuesday, be with uh, Liz's uh, uh, children's talks as they take place day by day. <coughs> we pray, Father, that you would be with us in our Bible study on Wednesday evening and uh, help us there as we uh, look into that passage to benefit from our time of fellowship together but uh, above all from you speaking into our hearts through your word <clears throat> we pray for the young people on friday pray that you would bless that time with them too we thank you for uh, ben's preaching uh, today and we pray lord that you'll be with him and bless him and speak to us through your word we pray and uh, both this morning and this evening lord speak into our hearts uh, your precious truths we pray and help us lord to apply your word to our hearts to make it real lord and to work it out in our lives day by day we pray father we just pray for our, our town and our community and pray lord that uh, through these difficult days you will be at work that they will be those lord who are wondering pondering uh, about the meaning of life and uh, Lord, seeking out the truths of your word, we pray, Lord, that they will draw near to you and that in days to come we will see, Lord, that you have been at work uh, in, our, in our community. And we pray for our land, O oh Lord, going through such difficult times. We pray for our government and pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom to those who are leading us through this uh, epidemic. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will help especially those who are working in the hospitals and in care homes and uh, in uh, different situations, Lord. We, we pray that you will help them and give them all needed grace and help as they care for the elderly and the sick, we pray. So, Father, uh, be with us now. We thank you for uh, every blessing that is ours in Christ and we pray, Lord, that you will draw near to us and help us and encourage us and strengthen us for we ask all these mercies now uh, in the name, that precious name, that lovely name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. So the reading today is taken from Acts chapter 15 and starting at verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you were circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles should hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them 
by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and it is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. I thank you for that reading. Let's pray as we come to these words. Father, we pray this morning as we look at this section of Acts, Lord, that you would give us guidance. Lord, we pray as we think about entry into the kingdom of God, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. You would give us insight into how we come to you, how we gain that access, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would challenge us as we look at this to go out and tell others. Amen. Well, as I've said, we're looking at this question, how do you enter the kingdom of God. And as we go through chapter 15, the first half of it, we're going to be thinking about three points. We're going to think about the problem that is being faced by all of those at the council at this point. We're going to think about the pondering as they go away and discuss the big issues before them. And then we're going to think about the promise from the Lord. We're going to think about about this entry, about this access that we have been given to the Lord. So let's spend time looking at that now. Now, when I worked in London, when I was working in the church, um, there were many times that we would see films being filmed in the area that we lived. Because uh, we lived in a place called Clerkenwell, which was close to Angel. But that meant that during the weekends, the area was very quiet. It was a midweek only kind of busy area. And so film companies would use the area for, for different shots. Uh, a scene in about a boy who was filmed just outside the church. During our time there, we saw Paddington 2 being filmed just outside our block of flats and around the corner from the church. It was very interesting, but also very strange to see. But one of the strangest things that I had happened to me because of a filming schedule was during the filming of a film called Holmes and Watson that came out in 2018. Because this film, it wasn't just filmed in the area that we live. No, it was filmed in the church that I worked for. Um, the, the filming company had rented out the church building for two weeks. They had built an amazing set in the main part of the church. They had changed it from looking like a church to looking like a courtroom. It was an amazing thing to see, and, and it was a great blessing to the church because the company did a lot of work on the property that needed to be done as part of the payment for the use of the space. But while it was a film set, it continued to be my workplace all of my things were in the buildings, my books. As I prepared kids talks or sermons, I needed access to all of my things. Now one day I realized that I had forgotten something important at the church and so um, I had to go down and it was a filming day, which made it very difficult to get in. 
I walked up to the front of the building, as I had done so many times in the past. I was ready to go straight up the stairs without really thinking about it. And at that point, I was met by a very large gentleman in a big black jacket asking me what I thought I was doing. I explained who I was, I told him that I worked there, that I needed to grab something from work so I could continue my day. And he stood and he looked at me and then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a radio and he spoke to someone for a minute or two and then he proceeded to stand aside and let me access the property. And while I was in there I grabbed everything I needed and while I stood there in the office grabbing these things I saw a few very famous faces walk by. And then I was taken to the food truck, only accessible to those in the church, to grab whatever I wanted. And I sat and had a coffee with a co-worker as we talked about this strange way the church looked at that point. It was crazy. But the amazing thing was that I had access to a film set. Because of who I was. I was allowed to walk into a place that was reserved for film stars and filming crew alone because of who I was. This morning, as we look at this meeting of the believers in Jerusalem, we see a discussion, all based around access. <clears throat> There's an uncertainty around who should have access and how this access should be gained. As we look at this, we will see the only way in which we can gain access to God is by his works. And it will come with some great news for us. But before we see the good news, well, we first have to see the problem in verses 1 through to 5. Now, one of the, the classic baseball television shots comes from a World Series game in 1975, in which the NBC, the, the channel, captured a player called Carlton Fisk jumping up and down, waving his arms, trying to coax this ball to, to stay in shot so that it would go for a home run. And it did. And that close-up would have been missed if the cameraman had followed the ball with his camera as he was meant to do. But the cameraman inside Fenway Park's scoreboard had one eye on a rat that was circling him. So instead of focusing the camera on the ball, well, he left it on Fisk. Sometimes we encounter problems like that rat. We have no idea how they will be resolved, but because of them, we may see God work in a way we never would have thought possible. What we see this morning is a group of people focused on a problem that, that they shouldn't be focused on. Paul and Barnabas have returned to them with great news about the Gentiles coming to faith. News about God working in amazing ways and immediately they begin to think about the rules that they have. But God will use this. And because they focused on this one thing, well we're going to see an amazing work of God unfold that does a great work for us personally right now. We see as we as we open, that, that there is this problem. After all that had been happening across Galatia, after the way God had been working in the Gentiles, and the trouble that had been out in those regions, well, that trouble follows them. It comes right to the door of the early church. This peaceful coexistence between Jew and Gentile that had been in this church was now disrupted by false teachers. By people coming with false truths about, about how you are saved. Unless you are circumcised according to the traditions taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. That's what they came and said. These Christians, they were from Judea. They were not content to keep their beliefs to themselves, but they felt compelled to persuade other Christians. They taught the brethren, coming all the way to Antioch to preach this message. William says it was very difficult for some Jewish Christians to accept that Gentiles could be brought into the church as equal members without first coming to the law of Moses. It was one thing to accept the occasional God-fearer into the church, someone already in sympathy with Jewish ways. It was quite another 
to welcome large numbers of Gentiles who had no regard for the law and no intention of keeping it. These Christians, they were coming and they were making negative judgments on everything that Paul and Barnabas had been doing across Galatia. On their recent missionary trip, they founded churches among the Gentiles without bringing them under the law of Moses. When in the city of Antioch in Pisidian, Paul preached the message. And by him, by Jesus, everyone who believes is justified for all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses in Acts 13 verse 39. These certain men, these men from Judea, would have objected saying Jesus saves us but only after we've done all we can to keep the law of Moses. But Paul taught a man could only be right with God on the basis of what Jesus had done. These certain men from Judea said Paul and Barnabas were all wrong in doing this and sadly well that's still the case sometimes in churches teaching today. Sometimes people teach a message of works-based salvation. They teach that we need to do everything we can to follow the laws in a certain way so that Jesus will be able to complete the salvation on top of what we already do. But that is wrong. We do not live in a faith that is Jesus plus everything we do. We live in a faith that is Jesus only. And because of Jesus, we go out and live in the way that he would want us to live. That is how we live. That is the faith that we have. The reason this is such a large problem is that for these teaching this, they are saying that without circumcision, there's no chance of salvation. Guzik said, we can just imagine how Satan wanted to take advantage of this situation. First, he wanted false doctrines of righteousness by works to succeed. But even if it didn't, he wanted a costly, bitter, doctrinal war to completely split and sour this church. This may be the greatest threat to the work of the gospel yet seen in the book of Acts. But this brings Paul and Barnabas into this dispute. They would not stand for this teaching. A teaching of exclusivity. They had seen God work without the Jewish practices... And they would not abandon that work so easily. In this, Paul and Barnabas show the heart of true shepherds to confront and dispute with those who insist on promoting false doctrines in the church. They care for their flock that they have been given. And so they're appointed with other believers to go. To go to Jerusalem. To see the apostles and elders, to bring these questions to them. And this discussion, it doesn't seem to be accepted. This dispute, it needs higher authority over it, we see. And there are some things that we as a worldwide church can agree to disagree on. There are a few things. Things like how many times to meet on a Sunday. The way in which services should be run. Whether you should have songs at the start, songs in the middle. We can, we can agree to disagree on those things, whether communion is with the one cup or the many. But there are some things that we simply cannot agree to disagree on. Things that are the foundation of all that Christianity is, and this is one of those things. Salvation through Christ alone is the bedrock of what the church is. And Paul and Barnabas are not willing to waver on this point. So they look to go to the apostles and the elders to look for their guidance. And we too do this. When we come to situations that, that may seem divisive, well, we come to scripture. And we sometimes go to the organisations that, that are above us. And we look into what God has said about these things. Because his word is the guide for how we should act, how we should live as a church. And it is important that we go there for our guidance. And not out there. And that isn't always easy, but it's what we're called to do. And the church backed them in this. Even though they're faced with this problem, they won't allow it to stop the spread of the gospel. The church backed them. The church sent them on their way. And Paul and Barnabas continue preaching as they go. As they travel through Phoenicia and Samaria, they tell the Gentiles. They tell of the Gentiles that have been converted. And it makes everybody glad. 
As Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, they find plenty of other Christians who rejoice at what God did among the Gentiles. And that is in contrast to these men from Judea, these men who claim that Jew alone, Jewish law alone is the only way to God. And when they come to Jerusalem, they're welcomed in by the apostles, by the elders, and they report everything that is going on, even as they enter Jerusalem. As they come before the council, they're met with this joy of the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. The, the council are eager to hear what God has been doing out in Galatia. But sadly, that didn't mean that, that all who heard these things were happy about the way in which they had been done. And we see that as the problem arises again in verse 5, doesn't it? For one of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles need to be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Many of those who opposed Paul and Barnabas were those who had been Pharisees. Their desire was to follow the law in all of its smallest details. If the Pharisees believed anything, they believed one could be justified by, before God by keeping the law. For a Pharisee to really be a Christian, it would take more than an acknowledgement that Jesus was the Messiah. It would take, it would, it, he would have to forsake his attempt to justify himself by, keeping, by the keeping of the law. He would have to accept that the work of Jesus was the basis of his justification. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas did not allow the pagans to merely add Jesus to their pantheon of Roman gods. They commanded that they turn from their vain gods to the one and only true God in Acts 14. These Pharisees who had become Christians had to do the same thing. Turn from their efforts to earn their way before God by keeping the law and look to Christ alone. You can't just add Jesus and say, well, Jesus helps me to justify myself through keeping the law. Paul had had to learn this himself when he came to the law. And so do we. We must not get bogged down in thinking that we can become good enough for God. We need to know that the only way that we could possibly be saved is solely through the work of Christ and, and nothing else. And what a huge problem this was. These people had not yet fully seen the power of the work of Jesus. They'd slipped into their old ways of thinking. And we, we too do this, don't we? Not just when we're thinking about salvation, but just in general life. We sometimes allow the morality of the world to become the basis of our whole moral structure. But that's not to be the case. This world is an immoral one. One that has turned from God. One that wants nothing to do with him. So we must not cling to our old moral compass. He is the one who shows us how to live. We must look to him for guidance. He is the one who has worked for our salvation. And he is the only one that we need. But in these early years of the church, this issue has to be addressed. And so as we continue on through verses 6 to 11, we see our next point, the pondering. Now this week we began the, the week, last weekend in fact, with the official announcement that our summer camp has been cancelled for 2020. It's going to be the first time since the mid-90s that I haven't been on that field for a camp at least once in the summer. And it's a very sad thing to think about. But it wasn't a decision that came quickly or easily. We first began speaking about what possibly might be happening with the summer camps back at the start of April. A lot of our concerns were around the fact that everything was unknown. And over the month between the two meetings, we, we all watched on as those in power came to different decisions about what possibly could happen and how long these limitations would be in place. Then two weeks ago, we had, that final, we had to make a final decision on the matter and we officially cancelled the current format of camp. It was a painful decision. I'm pretty sure that not everyone in that meeting agreed on that final decision. But it was one that was thought over long and hard. This council in Jerusalem are faced with a difficult decision. One much bigger than what would happen this summer at camp. They were looking into the basic principles of the early church. 
And so they were called to ponder how the Gentile believers would come before God. The apostles and the elders, they meet to consider these questions. This was an important issue. The leaders were not looking simply to let it lie. It must be addressed. The matter was simply too important. The questions raised by the Jerusalem council were immense. Are Christians made right with God by faith alone? Or by a combination of work and obedience of the law of Moses? Is the work of Jesus by itself enough to save the one who trusts in him? Or might we add our works to Jesus' works in order to make us right? They all come together. They knew this mattered and so they convened this council to think about these big issues. But it wasn't simply a meeting of yes men. This was a full-on discourse. We see, after much discussion at the start of verse 7, this was Christians seriously thinking about these things. They were serious about their faith. They were going to go into depth on this discussion. They were not going to give an answer cheaply to these people to appease anyone. They needed to make this decision properly. And Peter stands up. And he has a message for the council. Peter was one of the chief leaders. He, he wants to make his point known. He was the one spoken to by God on these issues back in Acts 10 and 11. So he has first-hand accounts of, of what God says about Gentiles. And so he wants to tell them these things. He wants to remind them of what God has already said. God led Peter as the original missionary to the Gentiles. And Peter says, God hasn't now changed his mind. Things aren't different all of a sudden. God still wants to bring the Gentiles in. God, who knows hearts and showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Peter continues, at this point, there was no expectation of circumcision before God. When Peter was sent to the Gentiles, he wasn't sent and told to circumcise them first and then allow them in. No, God showed he accepted them without those things in the same way that he accepted the Jewish believers at Pentecost, by sending the Spirit on them. And in saying, made no distinction between us and them, as he does just as he did to us, Peter makes an important observation. It came straight from his vision of the clean and the unclean animals, from which God taught him this principle. God has shown to me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That was Acts 10 verse 28. Those of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, who believed that the Gentiles were inherently common or unclean, in the sense of unholy, and that they had to be made holy, made clean by submitting to the law of Moses, they were missing the point. God had already accepted them in without that cleansing. God did not discriminate, verse 9 says, between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Peter looks back at the way God worked there. He knows the purification was done by faith rather than by following the law. Not only are Christians saved by faith, but they are purified by faith, not by works, not by actions, not by outward appearance. And so he questions these men. Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that we nor our ancestors could bear? Peter doesn't just stop by saying, God told me that they were clean, that they were ready, that they were accepted through the sending of the Spirit. No, he also looks to answer another possible objection that could come up. They might ask, well, why? Why bring them? Why not bring them under the, the law of Moses? What's the harm in it? What's the problem with circumcising them just in case? He knows the law was a yoke. A yoke that neither they or those Jews of old could actually bear. It's a demonstration by a survey of Israel's history. 
At the birth of the nation at Mount Sinai, they broke the law by worshipping the golden calf. At the end of Old Testament history, they still broke the law by disregarding the Sabbath, by marrying pagan women in Nehemiah 13. From beginning to end, Israel couldn't bear the yoke of the law. Those of the sect of the Pharisees who believed made a critical mistake. They looked at Israel's history under the law with eyes of nostalgia, not with the eyes of truth. If they had carefully and truthfully considered Israel's failure under the law, they would not have been so quick to also put Gentiles under that law. And Peter wants to make this final point. He brings everything together. He brings it to a close by stating the great truth of God's grace. Salvation through grace alone. For there's only one way to be saved. Voice says Peter, the Jew, would normally have said it the other way around. He would have said, we believe that they can be saved by grace through faith, just like us. That is, they can be like us. Yet, he turns it around. He notes that all are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Gentile and Jew. He knew that importance of a conversation. And he knew the importance of everyone coming to an understanding of salvation by grace alone. For it is, on, it is the only way to come to God. Do we care enough to ponder in that way? Do we care enough when we're hit with big questions to go to the Bible and then discuss them? There's been a big misunderstanding of the work of Christ here. Some of these new Christians, they failed to see the fundamental change that occurred once they were found in Christ. No longer were they called to follow the laws to bring themselves to God. No longer were they called to do the sacrifices of old, to be able to have a relationship with the Father. Now they were people who had been saved by grace. This time of pondering was full of importance. And only came when they discussed the works of God together. They dwelt upon the great work of Christ on the cross. And on, and on this, this salvation, Peter wants to explain that it has been stretched out by the Lord to all who would come to him. And in this time of pondering, they look to enlighten one another in this new way of thinking. And in light of this pondering... They're finally able to look at our final point now, verses 12 through to the end, 21, where we see the promise. This is a story about an, there's a story about an aged Indian, half naked, uh, famished, wandering into one of the western settlements, begging for food to keep him from starving. While eagerly devouring the bread bestowed by the hand of charity, a, a brightly coloured ribbon from which was suspended a dirty little pouch, was seen around his neck. On being questioned, he said it was a charm given to him in his younger days, and opened it, displaying a faded, greasy paper, which he handed to the investigator for inspection. It proved to be a regular discharge from the Federal Army, entitling him to a pension for life, signed by General Washington himself. He was someone who had the right to a great promise. And all he had to do was take hold of it. And he would have been able to live a completely different lifestyle. While looking at this question this morning, how do we enter the kingdom of God? Well, we come face to face with an amazing promise. One that as we have seen, we do not have to follow the laws of all to grasp hold of. But one that is ours if we, if we are found in Christ. And one that we must grab hold of. One that we must enjoy as part of our relationship with him. The whole assembly become quiet. They're amazed by what is being said. As they listen to Barnabas and Paul. Telling about the signs and wonders. That God has done among the Gentiles through them. Regardless of the, the problems that were faced, they were, they were honourable men. We see that they listen because God is being spoken about. And Barnabas and Paul, they, they confirm Peter's previous point. Essentially, they're saying, God accepted them, so shouldn't we? 
And when they finish, well, James speaks up. James has a word. There was no argument to follow these words. Peter's words, followed by Paul and Barnabas' explanation, had opened hearts to see God's promise. And at this point, James, the half-brother of Jesus speaking, was key. For Boyce tells us he was the leading member of the council at this time. So he stands and he speaks to them all. He says, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this. As he speaks out, he wants to look back at how God has worked. How God has brought people in, how God has changed this and as as James speaks here, these words would have been controversial to the Jewish Christians that are sat among them. For he speaks words of opening up the kingdom of God in a complete way. And we see that in the language that is being used here, the ancient Greek word for Gentile, well it could also be translated as nations. It, it is ethne. And the ancient Greek word for people in this passage is laos. The Jews considered themselves a laos of God, a people of God, and never among the ethne, the nations. For them, ethne and laos were contrasting words. So it was a challenge for them to hear that God at the, at, visited the Gentiles, the ethne, to take out of them a people, a laos for himself. No longer, as James speaks these words, is he saying that, that the Laos people are Jews alone. No, now they are uh, God's people within the Gentiles who are being brought out. Peter, uh, James is speaking of God taking a people for himself from the nation. He is telling the people that this Laos was already there. They did not need to be transformed by the act of circumcision or the coming under the Mosaic law. They were already God's people. An amazing promise for us that is backed up by scripture from Amos 9 in the following verses, which we see in verses 16, 17 and 18. James sits in a day when he can see the failings of Judaism. The troubles of all that has happened. They have rejected the Messiah. And God looks to rebuild that work in this form. By bringing the church together as both Jew and Gentile found in Christ. Rebuilding David's fallen tent. The restoration that God is working. And if there are any questions about Gentiles entry into the fellowship or the kingdom... They must see that God spoke about them in Amos back in those days. God doesn't say that they must become Jews. The promise was entry and acceptance of Gentiles who would bear his name. And that is an amazing truth that is on show here. And the final amazing thing that we see from, from Amos is that this promise is of old. This is not a new promise. Not simply a promise since, since Pentecost. This is a promise from old. God had planned this out. God knew this was going to happen. God knew that he had a people in the Gentile nation. That he would call to himself. This demonstrates that what God did among the Gentiles had a biblical foundation. Today many things are considered biblical if they simply don't contradict something in the Bible. Even though that may have no root in the scripture. But... For James and the rest, an outside authority settles this debate. The outside authority is God's word and it brings about a biblical foundation to the bringing in of these people. In this we see as start set councils have no authority in the church unless it can be shown that their conclusions are in accordance with scripture. Even this great council of early Christians, of the disciples, the apostles, the elders, only have the power... To bring judgment in line with scripture. And that is what James does by looking back to Amos. Looking back to God's word. He says it's a judgment. 
therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. The promises of God from old were to be written into church law. James essentially says, leave them alone. They are turning to God and we should not trouble them. At the bottom line, James decides that Peter and Barnabas and Paul are correct. And that those are the sect of the Pharisees. And the things that they believed were wrong on this point. Instead, we should write to them. Giving them rules, he says. Let's teach them how they should live. The things they should abstain from. To help those who are around them. This great promise was was not one that brought about an ability to do whatever they wanted. There were still guidelines that were to be followed. And so in this judgment from the Council of Christians, there was guidance on living for Christ that was given. If the decision was that one did not have to be Jewish to be a Christian, it must also be said clearly that one did not need to forsake the law of Moses to be a Christian. Gentile Christians had the right to eat sacrificed Uh, meat sacrificed to idols, to continue their marriage practices, to eat food without a kosher bleeding, because those were aspects of the Mosaic law they were definitely not under, but they were encouraged, possibly required, to lay down those rights in these matters as a display of love to their Jewish brothers and sisters. It's not the only place that we see this kind of teaching. In Romans 14, we heard teaching that while food is not what causes someone to become unclean they should be careful about their practices if it will cause someone else to stumble and so with the promise of our salvation through grace alone we too are warned about the way that we act we must remember to act in ways that would not bring people to that would not bring people to a wrong view of christ rather one that would bring them in and show them who christ truly was and what he truly has done What a huge question these men were faced with this morning. How do we enter the kingdom of God? How can we have a relationship with our Father in heaven? What a massive question for us. In these times of Acts, there was different thinking on the matter. And when this happened, we see that it needed to be dealt with in the most appropriate way possible. And throughout this passage, we have seen it addressed And we have been shown that the only way in which we can enter the kingdom of God is by grace alone. The grace of Christ's death on the cross for us. And for some that will be amazing news. Some of us will see the depth of our sin and we will know that we couldn't possibly fix our problems on our own. And so we will lean on the Lord for all that we need. Others may find this teaching difficult. Some may think that they don't need someone else's help for their salvation. They may feel as though they're good enough. But what we know from the Bible is that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The only way in which we have a chance to stand before a perfect king is to be found in Christ. But that's not all that is addressed in this passage. Along with the knowledge of being saved by grace... We must also see that whenever we come up against problems with regards to the faith, whenever we struggle with things that, that we think, we must always come to God. We must come to the Bible. We must trust in it. Trust in the Lord, for he is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And he works for the good of his people. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for that grace, Lord. We thank you as we explore this question now. This question of, of how we come into your presence. Lord, we thank you we can see that it is, it is only possible through Christ and not by works, Lord. But we pray that you would push us on to live life for you. Confident of our salvation, but eager to show people who you are, Lord. We pray that in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, let us sing together. Grace unmeasured, vast and free, that knew me from eternity, called me out before my birth to bring you glory. 
let's close in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for this great truth that we've thought of this morning, Lord. We pray that our hearts would be, would be challenged by these things. We would be challenged to look to you for all we need, Lord. We pray that we wouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that we, we can do a good work on our own. That just has to be topped up by you, Lord. We pray that we would know our complete loss without you. Father, we pray that you would challenge us this week to know this and to live for you wherever we may be, Lord. Pray that you would guide us now, that you would bless us and keep us. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us once again. And I hope to see you again during the week and then next weekend. God bless. <laughs>